Alleluia, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. 
Glory to you, Lord Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my disciples and say, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Caroline looks like an angel. 
Not the scary biblical kind of an angel that always shows up and says, do not be afraid. She is one of the more adorable angels, a big glowing smile, an infectious giggle, not yet scarred by the travails of life. Being five years old, she also often acts like an adorable angel, skipping down the aisle of the church, all sweetness and light with a beaming smile. She was here at nine o'clock, and apparently, according to her mother, kept asking, Mommy, is he still talking about me? She's excited to be there. But, but, because she's five, sometimes, sometimes, when she's tired or hungry or doesn't want to be there, her behavior is not exactly angelic. Normally, during the 11 o'clock service, you'll notice the children follow a cross procession. They go out to another room in the refectory to have their own age-appropriate worship service. Readings, sermon, music, and so on. And several of our musicians join us each week to lead us in song. It's all coordinated by Vicki, our wonderful Christian ed director, to create an environment where children can encounter Jesus in a way appropriate to them. A few weeks ago, I led the children's liturgy. It's one of my very favorite things to do. There's a photo of that moment, that event, in the back of the bulletin to see this little angel. We had a candle lighting, reading, prayers, a sermon with lots of questions. Some of them were even vaguely connected to what I had talked about in the sermon, but that's usually how it all goes. And the best part was at the end where we sang this hymn, and it felt like a type of march. So all 12 children, all the adults got up and started marching around in procession to the hymn as we sang. All but one child participated. Now, not five minutes before, she was laughing and giggling and dancing and participating fully in the group. Then suddenly, she scooted back in her chair, her little feet dangling out over the end, a scowl on her face, she crossed her arms in defiance, and the body language was unmistakable. I am not going to do that. While the rest of us marched by each time, it was so brilliant. When I got there, she just averted her eyes as if I did not <laughs> exist when she walked past. Jesus beckons and invites, never compels nor coerces. So that was my strategy to welcome the little angel, Caroline, back into the group. Now, the first time I passed her, I stretched out my hand and sang to the tune of the song, Oh, Caroline, why are you so sad? Why don't you join us? And her face softened a moment, her eyes focused on me, and she leaned forward and reached out a trembling hand, hesitated for a moment, and then she snatched it back, obviously very angry with herself for almost giving in. On the second pass, I reached out my hand a little closer, and she reached out and touched the tip of my finger, and I said, Caroline, come on. She scooted forward, touched my hand, had a look of uncertainty, not sure. It's very similar to the look on the back of the bulletin. And then all of a sudden, her hand withdrew, and it dropped into her lap. Her, lo her resolve was impressive, but diminishing. Now, the third pass was the last chance, because it was also the very last verse of the hymn. So I reached out as I passed, but intentionally not as close this time. She had to want to join us. She had to earn it, and then I called her by name, Caroline. She scooted out of the chair, as only a child can do, and clenched my hand, and with pursed lips, she looked up at me and said, I'll do it but I won't like it. <laughs> and we walked hand in hand through the rest of the song. Jesus said, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. On the first Easter morning, Mary Magdalene was the very first one to visit the tomb of Jesus. Why? We don't know precisely but we have some clues in the story and from simply human nature. Her hometown was Magdala. That's where she gets her last name. And Magdalene means the tower or the castle of fish. 
It was a fishing village where they processed the local fare and shared it at larger in the region. It was near in the Sea of Galilee where Jesus carried out most of his ministry in northern part of modern-day Israel. And Jesus very likely taught in the synagogue there. And we know from the story earlier that Mary Magdalene was one of Jesus' very first disciples. She may have been the first one as far as we know. She was not, I will add, she was not a reformed prostitute, nor was she Jesus' wife. To claim either robs her of the true authority that she deserves. Mary Magdalene is mentioned 12 different times in the Gospels. That's far more than most of the other disciples. One story says that Jesus healed her of seven demons. That is, seven means a complete number, a wholeness. People then thought that demons were the source, the, the reason for most diseases, not genes or germs, not bad habits or bad luck. Her seven demons could have manifested in various ways. Maybe it was a, a physical ailment, a mental one, an emotional one that Jesus healed. Whatever it was, if she had seven of them, a complete number, she was full of bad things in her life. She was a wreck, completely broken, and somehow Jesus healed her, made her whole again. I find it is very often the person who has experienced being wrecked by life that knows what it means to be healed, to experience resurrection. They've hit bottom and know that they can only go up. Now, the demons she may have might be like those that still haunt us. And I find, too, it's always helpful to name your demons. They have less power over you. Hers or ours might be things like despair, lack of hope, betrayal, injustice, heartbreak, fear, sickness, alienation. What demons are running amok in your life right now? And imagine if in one moment, in one brief presence, all of those demons in your life were healed. How liberated would you be? How different would your life be? That's what Mary experienced. That was who she was, and that is the main reason that she followed Jesus. We also know two other vital facts about Mary Magdalene. She was present at the crucifixion after all the male disciples ran away. Maybe she was braver than they were. Maybe she was less likely to get erect, arrested, and probably both. And secondly, we know she was the very first person, when it was still dark, to visit the tomb. She must have been devastated and heartbroken at the loss of her friend, but still she was faithful. She showed up. She kept trying to be there, even when she did not want to be. And there she was, on the very first Easter morning. And she rode up or walked up to the tomb, and there was this massive door. In this case, it was a giant stone that had been rolled away. So she ran and told two of the other disciples. They showed up, looked inside, and went home. But Mary stayed. She kept looking for Jesus. And imagine her standing there alone, crying her eyes out. And she bent down to look in the tomb, just like we might do, one more time, just to make sure, even though you already know what the answer is, nothing is going to change. But this time she encountered two angels sitting there, one at the head, one of the foot, where the body was supposed to be. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? What a stupid question to ask. She might have responded, but instead she was polite. That's what you do when someone you love dies. You're sad. You're heartbroken. And instead she said, where have they taken my Lord so I can honor him? Let me take him away. And leaving those angels behind, she turned around, that is, looked away from death, away from the tomb, out into the world, and saw Jesus but did not recognize him. Why not? It may be that grief clouded her vision. We all know it can cloud our vision or judgment. It could be that she could not believe a dead person could be resurrected. It is shocking to imagine that then or now. It simply didn't happen. Or maybe the resurrected Jesus simply looked very different than he had. A five-year-old version of yourself, a 50-year-old version of yourself, and an 80-year-old version bear similarities, but they are hardly recognizable as the same person. Imagine your resurrected body, continuity with the old, but a new creation. 
In any case, Jesus asked her precisely the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? Note the distance that creates. Rather than calling her by name, she had to figure out who he was for herself. Only when Jesus called her by name, Mary, did she recognize him. And with disbelief, she called out Rabbi, Rabboni, means teacher. That's probably what she called him all those years, way back in the synagogue when she knew him. It's a form of familiarity and respect, a closeness. What did she do next? What would you do if someone that you loved, you thought was dead, was standing right in front of you? She rushed to take hold of him, to embrace him, never let him go. The embrace was a physical embodiment of disbelief turned to hope. And Jesus' response is very bizarre to this embrace, at least it is at first. Someone suggested, you know, Jonathan, maybe Jesus is just not a hugger. That might be true, but I doubt it. That embrace, I believe, probably lasted for a very long time. But Mary and Jesus could not stay in that moment forever. Because each of them, Mary and Jesus, had a vital job to do. Mary Magdalene was to become the very first apostle. Apostle means one who sent with the message, in this case, the good news, the gospel about Jesus Christ. She was an ambassador. Because she was to be the first one, she was headed off to tell the disciples, the other brothers and sisters, and to tell all the world what she had experienced, that Jesus was alive. And so Jesus said, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go and tell my disciples that I am ascending to my Father, going to meet God, my God and your God. Mary was sent out to live this new resurrected life, rather than to hold on to, rather than to be stuck in the past. All the demons that held on to her were gone, dismissed, left behind. We know from experience that there are always scars from these figurative demons in our lives. Jesus himself still bore the scars of the crucifixion, the nails in his hands and feet, the spear in his side. But he was not stuck there. Even death did not hold him. But more than that, his mission was much more refined, much clearer. He was not on his way back to the disciples. That was Mary's job. He was on his way to the Father. And the whole idea is he was going to invade hell and release all the captives. He would give hope to all those who want to embrace new life, to turn disbelief and despair into good news. Jesus was going to the Father to take all of creation with him. On these, this Easter morning, I find myself a mix of both that little angel Caroline and Mary Magdalene. Maybe we all are. We could refuse to participate at all or only on our own terms or only in our own time. We can be stuck in the past, preferring the company of old demons, but quite frankly, the scars from them should be sufficient. We can keep looking in empty tomb, waiting for a different answer to arise, but it never does. We can be mad at God or organized religion for what they've done or not done for us and to us. Despite it all, God is still there, reaching out to you, calling you by name as long as it takes. Mary and the little angel, all of us, have to reach out our hands and take that first step. That's faith. God wants us to reach back towards the divine. You don't even have to like it. You just need to stick to it. Keep being faithful. Because Jesus always goes ahead of us, calling us by name, beckoning, inviting us to leave the tomb behind and embrace new life. Amen.
Let us pray to the risen Lord, saying, Hear our prayer. We pray for all who come to the tomb this morning, that seeing the stone rolled away, we may move from fear to the great joy of Easter. Risen Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the church, that we may bear witness to the power of the resurrection. Risen Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the leaders and people of all nations, for refugees and immigrants, and for all who live with the threat of war and terror, that the peace of Christ may reach to the ends of the earth. Risen Lord, in your mercy, we pray that God, who shows no partiality, will break through our hatred and divisions and free us to seek the common good. Risen Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who face disaster, hunger, poverty, and injustice, that Christ will raise them from despair. Risen Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who wait for healing and hope, for all those who have been commended to our prayers, for people suffering from COVID, for people throughout the world living with HIV and AIDS, for those struggling with addiction and those in recovery, for those whom we now name. that the brightness of this Easter morning will fill their hearts with new life. Risen Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who have died. For Raymond Sims, Glenna Gates Franco, Pauline Foster Mullins, and Bob Cope. For all those in whose memory flowers and music are given this Easter. For victims of gun violence for those who mourn, for those whom we now remember. That they may share in Christ's glorious victory over death and the grave. Risen Lord, in your mercy. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning and happy Easter to you all. Thank you for joining us today on Easter Sunday. If you're our guest, you're interested in learning more about Calvary Church, there are visitor cards there in the back of the pew. If you feel, please uh, fill one out and drop one in the uh, offertory plate as it comes by. One of the clergy will contact you this week, not tomorrow, I assure you. Give it a couple days. Thank you to all the choir and other musicians Uh, They offer the music at 9 and 11 today and then all throughout Holy Week. Thank you also to all who gave Easter Memorial flowers and music. Names are printed in the bulletin. We greatly appreciate that. And for all those who decorated the church yesterday with those flowers, 
Thank you also to the Altar Guild who set up, took down, set up again over and over. Uh, next Sunday is the bishop's visit. Bishop Ketlin Solak will be here for confirmation at 11, and she will preach and celebrate at all three services. And I'm very pleased to say, look for an, out, an announcement this week, uh, Wednesday or so, when we announce our new associate rector for Calvary Church. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, and offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God Almighty, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.
let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Oh, 